Hey everyone, welcome back. Today, we're diving deep into one of the most anticipated games of the year, Black Myth Wukong. Set to release in mid-August for PC and PlayStation, this fantasy adventure game promises a vast and mythical land to explore, tough bosses to battle, and a plethora of spells and abilities to unlock. The story is said to be rich with themes of love, hate, greed, and fury. The Xbox release has been delayed, likely due to optimization issues on the Series S, but let's just focus on what we have seen so far. Black Myth Wukong is being developed by Game Science, a relatively new studio. And let me tell you, the game looks stunning. The animations are polished, and the effects are top-notch, surpassing many games out there at the moment. Each boss in their respective arenas are beautifully crafted and incredibly creative. Early hands-on impressions have been overwhelmingly positive. We've seen numerous boss fights, which are clearly a highlight of the game. With over 80 bosses in the full game, I'm optimistic the ones we have yet to see will be just as impressive. Game Science has given us a lot to be excited about, and everything looks fantastic so far. Trust me, I would be the first to call out any red flags. We have so much data of people who have played portions of this game, and literally all of it is positive. That generally means that this will be a fantastic game. However, nothing can ever be great without someone trying to tear it down. There is one negative controversy going around at the moment, and it's that this game is created by a bunch of bigots and sexists because their logo resembles a sperm. Yeah, you heard me right. I'll, I'll say that one more time. This game is created by a bunch of bigots and sexists because their logo resembles a sperm. Looks more like a lightning bolt to me, but let's just, let's run with this. Let's assume it is a sperm. How does this make game science sexist or bigoted? Cause I would love to know. The sperm is what determines a baby's biological sex at the moment of fertilization. IGN, they really reach for this one. Every egg has an X chromosome while sperms contain either an X or a Y chromosome. So if the sperm has an X chromosome, then the baby will be a female. And if the sperm has a Y chromosome, then the baby will be a male. So if anything, the logo being a sperm is the most inclusive you can be when talking about men and women. And that concludes my sexual education course. Be sure to subscribe to keep up to date on your next class. So yeah, that's what's going on right now. But we're just going to go ahead and move on to what gamers really care about, and that's the game. I definitely don't think this game will have an open world like Elden Ring. Having an open world and deep exploration in games is a massive selling point, and Game Science would have most definitely mentioned and showed this off by now, which is completely okay to me. And here we go. People are going to get mad at me here, but I'm going to say it anyways. I am not the biggest fan of open world games. Okay, yep, I said it. It's just too much for me. Like, I, I know it's a me problem. I definitely see why people are attracted to open world games, but I don't mind linear experiences. I don't think they're a bad thing. The most fun I have in these games are the boss fights. And sounds like this game will get you from boss fight to boss fight with not much in between. Maybe I'm wrong and there will be lots to explore between these boss fights, but we'll just have to wait and see. But I'm getting the feeling the game will feel more like a boss rush than anything else. I just prefer linear adventure Souls-like games. Maybe an unpopular opinion, I know but it is my opinion. I'm sure there will be some exploration to scratch that itch for a lot of you. From the footage we've seen, Black Myth Wukong plays like a Souls-like game, but the developers describe it more as an adventure game, which is fair. The gameplay is much quicker than most Souls-likes and doesn't appear to be as punishing, which may be a turnoff to some, but regardless, the gameplay still looks phenomenal. I don't think anyone can argue against that. I think the devs are hesitant to slap the Souls-like label on it because the game most likely won't be an open world exploration game like Elden Ring was, and they don't want their game to be compared to Elden Ring and want it to stand on its own, which is fair. I think people are just saying Souls-like because there's a lot of Souls-like elements included in the game, such as unique cool bosses to fight with several mechanics to learn and that there won't be multiple difficulty settings. One developer said, you can't change the difficulty, but the difficulty doesn't remain the same for the whole game. The philosophy is that players fight like a hero. When we were developing the game, we had to make a lot of hard choices. The route we chose was to make the player have lots of tries so that after each battle, they could think about what is the best combat method for this fight specifically. So again, this kind of reinforces the game being similar to Souls-likes, as there will be plenty of boss encounters that will involve a lot of trial and error. And like Souls-likes, you can expect plenty of deaths to the tough bosses. All things considered though, the game sounds and looks extraordinary. And speaking of gameplay, let's break down some of the key gameplay moments we have seen so far. On August 19, 2020, we saw a 13-minute gameplay trailer 
showcasing a linear path filled with various cannon fodder enemies. This path led us to a mini boss fight with the wolf captain wielding a fiery dual bladed staff. The player used spells and abilities for immobilizing, creating protective auras, and executing charged attacks. The wolf captain showcased many mechanics such as a boomerang attack with his staff, a dash, some close range fire attacks, and he also leaps into the air and then dashes down in an attempt to stomp on you. After defeating the wolf captain, you unlock the ability to morph into him, using his abilities against future bosses. This morphing mechanic is incredibly unique and exciting. You can see this later on in the wolf-like boss fight, which the art style of this boss is just absolutely incredible. This boss does a claw uppercut, a pounce attack. The wolf jumps from roof to roof and then pounces on you. The wolf also does a howling AOE attack, just some awesome mechanics that don't look generic and just feel very immersive. We get to see another spell used in this fight that spawns a bunch of clones to go out and attack the boss for you. Some excellent attention to detail is shown off after the boss does this swipe attack. After the attack, it then goes to licking its paws in a recovery animation in which we can unload lots of damage on it. Just again, a super immersive gameplay feature. We see here that we can morph into the wolf captain from before, which is just an extremely unique and awesome concept. It will be a lot of fun to kill a mini boss and then be able to use their powers against the main bosses. You can see during this fight that the movesets are the same as the mini boss, which is just very, very cool. All in all, an extremely well received gameplay showcase. A year later, we got a look at a bright snowy environment. The snow is very fluffy and the particle effects are just amazing. A mini boss wielding a one handed sword is shown off. They do some cool swipe attacks and a drop kick attack. Your character, after using a dodge ability, now leaves behind this translucent image of them, which just looks super cool. Another spell is showcased that draws a circle of fire around the character that the boss can't go through, allowing you some time to recover. We saw some more shape shifting, this time into a bat-like creature for level traversal, leading us to this electrifying dragon we fight on an iced over lake. The dragon does some swipes with his claws, which when hit applies an electrifying damage over time effect on the player. The boss does a roar attack and do this tail slam attack. The dragon can also send a line of electricity through the lake towards the player. It also goes full Godzilla here and sends a beam of electricity from its mouth. The bosses are also staggerable. However, from the UI, I'm not sure how the player knows when it's about to be staggered. Maybe it's when the boss loses about a third of its health, at least in this example, that seems to be the case. But nonetheless, you can deal massive damage once the boss is staggered. You can see that there is not only abilities and spells, but you can also swap between stances to get access to different movesets. Those different stances being Smash Stance, Pillar Stance, and Thrust Stance. The boss then looks to enter a Phase 2, in which it hovers above the lake doing loads of electrifying AoE damage, in which the player swaps to the Pillar Stance and climbs and chills on their staff to avoid the damage and allowing their staff to lengthen over time in which they can use it to smash the boss afterwards. Another very well received gameplay trailer. That was just a breakdown of a couple of the bosses we've seen so far, with many, many more still to come. From colossal frogs to ferocious tigers and fearsome bears, this game is packed with super creative and downright cool bosses. There is certainly no shortage of wild animals absolutely juiced to the max here. In August of 2022, they give us a six minute in-game cutscene showcasing the Spider Queen. And I'll share a comment from someone who actually understands this story behind the Spider Queen. The most tragic aspect of the story is that in the end, the Spider Queen will eat this unknown spouse at this so-called celebrating wedding. It's the nature. Meanwhile, the last words get out, expressing in such desperate manner, also tells us how much she loves him even after all those years. She is suppressing her nature and wants her spouse to live. Kind of like Professor Snape and Harry Potter. This is a fair take on the story arc here, and I can't wait to jump in the game and see more about this spider love story. If you have any other thoughts on how you think this story might go with the Spider Queen, then drop a comment. I would love to read them. On July 1st of 2024, we got to witness another boss fight against this sleeping dragon. The gameplay just looks incredible. You can just tell that all the effects are extremely polished. One reason for the game's delay and why it turned out so elegant is because the developers transitioned from Unreal 4 to Unreal 5. It was a brilliant move. The proof is in the pudding. As for the different additions for the game, I will put them on the screen now, so feel free to pause and look through them. But remember everyone, never pre-order. Resist the FOMO of the pre-order bonus. Just do it, just resist it. Wait until the game comes out and make an educated decision on whether or not it's a game you would enjoy. Again, the game doesn't appear to be open world like we touched on earlier, which is fine in my opinion. All the features and graphics clearly show a ton of effort and polish, making up for the game not being as open as some might have hoped. 
and I generally like more linear titles, so a plus for me and others who like that as well, I guess. That's not to say open world enjoyers won't like this game. I'm sure you absolutely will, especially if you're a fan of fighting numerous majestic bosses. Although it may not be as difficult as most Souls likes, that's not to say fulfilling the power fantasy of Wukong won't be a great time. I think it absolutely will be. And again, everyone who was fortunate enough to get their hands on it early have had nothing but positive things to say. The game releases on August 20th, 2024, so definitely mark your calendars for this one and keep an eye out for new content from now until then. Be sure to subscribe as I will cover anything new we learn about the game. And as always, thanks for watching. Take excellent care of yourselves and goodbye.